I find something new and interesting here, and it's always been that way. So uh, it's su such a wonderful place. I wanted to tell you some about the work my students and I are doing to gain insight into human movement dynamics and movement disorders using computer simulation. The basic idea is to combine experimental data that we get in motion capture laboratories or from medical images with biomechanical models to gain insight into the underlying causes of movement disorders and uh, to design better treatments for understanding uh, human uh, movement pathology. The treatment of gait abnormalities is complicated, and I'll focus on pediatric gait abnormalities because it's an area in which we've made some progress. And it's complex because there are a few potential causes. Impaired motor control, for example, if a child with cerebral palsy comes in, uh, the origin of the disorder is an uh, injury to the brain, and they have abnormal coordination of the many muscles it takes to produce movement. They frequently have spasticity. So spasticity is a heightened stretch reflex. So we all have stretch reflexes. When a muscle is stretched fast, it produces force to restore its position. Spasticity is a, a decrease in the threshold for that reflex. So a lower stretch velocity produces a, an exaggerated response. So you can imagine if you have spasticity of your uh, bicep and you try to reach, it's stretching the bicep and you get a jerk response. And that's basically what spasticity is. Weakness or the inability to generate uh, sufficient force. Muscle contractures because muscles uh, developing in the face of abnormal patterns of excitation, the muscles can become uh, shortened and produce excessive passive force. And also because the bones are developing in the face of abnormal forces, they also have deformities. So there's a whole set of things going on when somebody walks into a clinic or into a laboratory, and uh, it's tricky to figure out what the underlying cause of the abnormal movement is simply by watching them walk. The treatment is also complex because depending on the cause, there are a variety of possible treatments. Orthopedic surgeries are frequently done in which, for example, for bone deformities, bones are divided and reoriented to produce a more normal limb alignment, or tendons may be released from one side of a joint and transferred to the other side of the joint to better actuate movement on both sides of the joint. Physical therapy to uh, improve coordination or increase strength. Orthotic devices, braces, or other assistive devices are frequently used. Neurosurgery is done, so in cases of spasticity, there's a neurosurgical technique called selective dorsal rhizotomy, and that's a surgery in which the, the dorsal root ganglion are microdissected. This is where the sensory fibers are coming back, and they're surgically divided, some of them are, to diminish the input to the spastic reflex loop. So that certainly diminishes spasticity, but frequently results in sensory loss and weakness, so, uh, and is, of course, irreversible. Or tone-altering medication, so you can take drugs or you can inject uh, Botox, a neurotoxin, into muscles and change muscle force that way. So it's pretty tricky to figure out when somebody comes in and they have a complicated movement abnormality, for example, what role bone deformities, muscle contracture, muscle spasticity, motor coordination, and whether they should have surgery or therapy or braces, and that's a problem that's faced uh, every day. And as a result of this complexity, what we see post-op, and we analyzed thousands of kids post-op, is that some of them get a lot better, and some of them don't, and some of them get a little worse. So the question is, can biomechanical models provide some insights that allow us to have more consistent positive outcomes for treatments for gait disorders? So that's the basic setup. What I'd like to do is just give you a, a brief introduction to how biomechanical models might provide some insight. I'll give two clinical examples related to movement disorders and cerebral palsy. And then I'll close with a set of challenges for biomedical computing and bioengineering in general so that we can advance the field of uh, simulation-based treatment planning and biomedical computation in general. So that's the basic outline. It's not a uh, one-hour talk. It's probably going to be 40 minutes. So what I would encourage you to do is ask questions during. If we're going through, if you have a question, clarification, just raise your hand, and uh, that'll break things up and make it more interesting. Cool.
So to think about how biomechanical models might help provide insight, first consider just the basic outline of events involved in the generation of voluntary movement. So of course, you begin with a, a neural command in the central nervous system that activates muscle. Uh, muscle generates force by the interplay of actin and myosin. The hierarchical structure of muscle produces very high forces, multiple body weights, for example. Muscles operate at a mechanical disadvantage about 10 to 1. So if you're holding a 50 pound weight in your hand, you're generating about 500 pounds in your uh, elbow flexors. So muscles generate very large forces. They act on a complicated system of geometry. And it's not just one force generating forces and moments about the joint, but it's many muscles acting in concert in the face of gravity that produces movement. It's of course not an open loop system. It's not just neural command producing movement, but we have proprioceptors in muscle. Spindles are sensing the length and velocity of muscle, and tendon organs are sitting in muscle, uh, in tendon sensing force, and so it's a closed loop uh, control system. Perfectly tuned that enable us to do amazing feats uh, and learn new activities. And then everything goes wrong. So there's impaired motor control, abnormal muscle tendon dynamics, abnormal geometry, and that produces abnormal motion. When someone walks into the lab, what can we measure? We're severely limited in what we can measure. We can measure the pattern of muscle excitations, the electromyographic activity. So if somebody comes in, we can see, ah, this muscle's on abnormally. Maybe it's a problem. And we can measure observed motion. So we can see we have abnormal motion, we have abnormal EMG, but we don't know what motion is caused by what muscle. Remember, we've got 50 muscles working in concert. Each of them has a very complicated effect on a, a many degree of freedom system. So we can't say, aha, that abnormal activity is causing that abnormal motion. Let's inject that with Botox or do a surgical lengthening. It's very difficult to establish those kinds of cause-effect relationships. The problem is further complicated when you think about the treatments like a muscle tendon lengthening, strengthening exercises, bony surgeries, osteotomies, tendon transfers, braces, neurosurgery. They affect parts of the system for which we have uh, no measurements. So what we're trying to do is complement experimental approaches by bringing biomechanical models into the picture and having mathematical models of normal and abnormal muscle tendon dynamics, normal and abnormal geometry, and normal and abnormal motion so that we can establish the effect of abnormal excitation and we can simulate the effect of all these various treatments on motion. So simulation-based treatment planning complements experimental approaches because we always make measurements of somebody before they're going to have uh, some kind of orthopedic reconstruction or neurosurgery. So we certainly get the experimental data. But with the simulations, we get estimates for parameters that are difficult to estimate. For example, if you're going to do a strengthening exercise or a tendon lengthening, what we're trying to affect is muscle force. We can't measure muscle force, but we can get estimates of muscle forces in simulation. We can do what-if studies. So what if I were to, let's say I have a subject-specific dynamic simulation of somebody with stiff knee gait. What if I were to inject their one of their quadriceps, the rectus femoris, with botulinum toxin, would that improve their knee flexion? We can do that in simulation quite easily. And I think most important, we can establish cause-effect relationships. So we can see what forces are causing what motions because we have a mathematical representation of the system. We can establish exactly the set of muscle forces that's producing the normal or abnormal. So that's the basic setup. What I wanted to do now was go through two examples, one simple, one more complex. And I picked this example. I actually presented the first set of patients in this at University of Utah, I think, seven years ago. We've done 15 patients. We've done 150 now. So I'll show the, I'll show the results of that. Um, and then I'll show another uh, dynamic example. Before I jump into the example, anybody have questions or comments on the first part? Yes, please. I have a simple question. The, the tendons, are they, 
Tendons are in series with muscle, so you have muscle fibers that connect to bone through tendon. And so uh, the tendon may be detached from the bone and rerouted and attached somewhere else, so then its muscle is actuating on the other side of the joint. Yeah. Yes, please. Isn't this uh, strategy is a real rational, wonderful strategy, but it's an uh, unconstrained problem. Uh, there's an infinite number of muscle excitations of the different muscle groups that can produce a given gait, a given stance, a given anything. So is, how do you deal with that problem? Yes, so I'll tell you in a little bit more detail with some of the algorithms, but the basic question is that the fundamental problem in movement biomechanics, you have many actuators and more actuators than degrees of freedom, so there, your, your brain has an infinite possibility for how to actuate muscles and how do we take that into account. Um, how do we take it into account for normal motion, and then how do we take it into account for abnormal motion where probably nothing's being optimized? Um, the way we take, the way we handle that is that we impose constraints on the system, and that we solve the whole system together. And in that case, there are many degrees of freedom, many equations, and so there's a there's a less degree of redundancy, although there's still some redundancy. But then we pose it as an optimization problem. And I'll show you the results for different optimization criteria, which produce realistic and unrealistic. The other way we constrain it is we make measurements. We measure EMG. So if I have somebody with an abnormal gait, I measure their patterns of excitation, and I make the simulation have those abnormal patterns of excitation. So it's still not uh, perfect, but it's the, it's the best we can do. OK. Let's go for the first example. And it relates to treatment of crouch gait. Uh, crouch gait is very common in cerebral palsy, especially among kids with spastic diplegia, where both lower limbs are affected. And it's most frequently thought to be caused by either hamstring contracture or hamstring spasticity. So crouch gait is walking with exaggerated knee flexion. And you can even see in this guy, if you look closely, you can see his hamstrings, lateral hamstrings, kind of popping out there. And if you look at the EMG activity, frequently it's exaggerated as well. So it's thought, and it crosses behind the knee. So it's thought, maybe this muscle near the end of swing, when the muscle's trying to, when the knee is trying to extend, the hamstring is limiting the extension, and you land in a crouch, and then you, you walk in a crouch. Okay, it's very inefficient to walk this way. It costs two or three times the metabolic energy it takes to walk with uh, normal gait, and over time it usually gets worse as somebody gains weight, and so uh, it's important to try to intervene. So it's thought to be caused by either a muscle that is too stiff, so it doesn't length, doesn't achieve the, the desired length for normal walking, or spastic, that is it can't lengthen fast enough, and so it catches. So we wanted to see if we could analyze the lengths and velocities of the hamstring muscles and provide some insight. And we did that by collecting 3D gait kinematics on a bunch of unimpaired kids, building musculoskeletal models of individuals with and without cerebral palsy. We built these models from initially from MRI of the individuals with cerebral palsy. That was uh, quite expensive and time consuming. We then developed methods to take a generic model and deform that model to represent the, the key features of individuals with cerebral palsy. And from the 3D gait kinematics in a musculoskeletal model, you see the hamstrings are a relatively straightforward muscle. We could calculate their lengths versus the gait cycle. So I'm calculating their lengths from when the foot contacts the ground to when it contacts the ground again. So that's the normalized length and the normalized velocity and they're normalized so we can compare subjects of different sizes. And then I can take somebody who has crouch gait and I can see whether or not they have short hamstrings. So here's normal plus minus two standard deviations. Here, this subject where the length needs to be long right there before your heel contacts, this subject has hamstrings that are shorter than normal. And in those cases, we might conclude that hamstrings contracture is a contributing factor to their stiff knee gait and they would be potentially a good candidate for hamstring lengthening surgery. I should point out, when we got into this, I surveyed uh, the, the, the best children's hospitals who were treating individuals with cerebral palsy in Crouchgate, not all of them, but several of them. In some hospitals, 
if you went in and you had a crouch gait, there was over 90% chance you were going to have a hamstring lengthening. In other hospitals, essentially no one got one. And the rationale for deciding who was going to and not going to have hamstring surgery was obviously uh, different. So we wanted to have a more rational uh, procedure for deciding who should and should not have hamstring lengthenings. Now, if the hamstrings, say, were long enough, but they couldn't lengthen fast enough, during swing, the hamstrings stretch fast. And if they are spastic, they won't be able to stretch fast enough. So there are many subjects in which you plot the velocity and it's going long and it starts to stretch and then you get a catch and then it doesn't stretch anymore. And those, in those cases, you might suggest hamstring spasticity would be a problem and they may be a candidate for an injection of Botox, which would reduce spasticity or maybe a hamstring surgery. Okay, so, and then the other question was, well, what if they were short and they had a hamstring lengthening? Would they get longer? And if they were slow, they weren't lengthening fast enough and they had a hamstring surgery, would they get longer? So those were the questions we asked. The other was, well, if they, their hamstrings got longer and they got faster, did they walk better? Was their knee extension improved? So those were the basic questions. And we did that by measuring gait kinematics in 150 subjects, uh, ran through a, a musculoskeletal model, and then calculated their lengths. So the first basic question was, how many of these subjects walked with short or slow hamstrings? They were, uh, yeah, Ben. Can I ask a question? Uh, how long does it take to do an analysis like that? Well, you have 150 patients, how long to do one? Yeah, so uh, it takes about two hours to do their gait analysis. They're coming in and getting that anyway. To do their hamstring length analysis takes us an additional five minutes. So it, we developed a whole pipeline for just automating that whole thing and just spits the plot out. And so actually now uh, a bunch of hospitals do this just as a matter of their routine because it's pretty straightforward. We give them the software, we give them the pipeline, we give them the model, and they just spit out the plots. I'm not sure, is anybody here from Shriners? I'm not sure if Shriners here in Salt Lake does it, but a lot of children's hospitals do it now. Question? Yes, please. Um, can the muscles be remodeled just by fixturing? Uh, so, for example, stretching? Yeah, or, right. Uh, there is some evidence that certainly in, in unimpaired subjects, if you stretch a muscle, it will remodel. Um, and in individuals with cerebral palsy who walk on their toes, where they have tight calf muscles, one therapy is to stretch the muscles and put them in a cast and a brace and put them in a cast. And that can work, it doesn't work very well, it's not used that much. Usually um, the surgical candidates are at a point where they've tried stretching and physical therapy and they're getting tighter and tighter and tighter. They need to do something. So how many of the subjects walk with short or slow hamstrings? Uh, about a third were normal length, normal speed, and they were all candidates for hamstring surgery. About a third had short hamstrings, so short or short and slow. Almost all of the ones that were short also lengthened more slowly than normal. And about a third uh, had normal length, but uh, they stretched at a slower lengthening speed. Did they get longer or faster after they had hamstring surgery? Well, if they were short before, they tended to get longer. If they were slow before, they tended to get faster. But if they were not short or they were not slow, they didn't get longer or faster, even after they had a hamstring lengthening surgery. The, the 150 patients came from two different hospitals, and these were the hospitals where 90% got it and 10% got hamstring lengthening. So we had a big pool of subjects who had short hamstrings that never got lengthened, and another pool that didn't have short hamstrings that always got lengthened. So we could see where, uh, what the problem cases were. So did they get better? I'll show you some cases. So here's a girl whose hamstrings were short and slow, preoperatively. Postoperatively, she had a hamstring lengthening. They were longer and faster. She's smoother. She's better. Her knees are straighter. Walks with uh, less energy. So that was, that was uh, the decision was made consistent with the muscle lengths. Yeah. 
Yeah, usually uh, there's between 12 and 18 months is usually we try to wait because after they have a surgery and therapy, um, that's a, they have to adapt to the new musculoskeletal system. So, um, so you can probably see her, she looks older, right? She grew. And so that's one of the challenges with this. If you have somebody, they have a surgery, you wait a year and you measure them, it's hard to attribute exactly the changes you see to only the surgery because they've had a bunch of things that happen. Yes, please. It's, it's pretty consistent within hospital. Um, usually there's a surgical team that does this and they have uh, inpatient PT and then a team of PTs. The biggest variation in therapy post-surgically is how engaged the family is because right after the surgery the, the, they get a lot of physical therapy and whether, how much it continues depends on the, the resources and engagement of the family. But that can make a difference. Yeah, Andy. Did you correlate muscle model Uh, we tried, but you can't uh, because you have the, the, the velocity and length of the hamstrings depends on its uh, moment arm about the hip and knee, the knee angle, the knee angular velocity, the hip angle and hip angular velocity, and a little bit the hip adduction and, and pelvis motion. So by just calculating the length you, you, and velocity, you get all that information in a new variable. It's not the perfect variable. It's not that this one variable predicts the outcome. It certainly doesn't, but it's a useful variable that combines what is measured and puts it into the coordinate system of a muscle, and that's what they're gonna. That's what the decision is to operate or not. Did you have a question? Is there a question? Last one was how many of these patients have bone deformities? Is that taken into the model at all? And how much of that is these troubled patients? Yeah, so, so uh, we've modeled bone deformities. For the hamstrings, the bony deformities don't make a huge difference because they go from the pelvis down to the tibia. So you can have a pretty big torsional deformity of the femur and it doesn't change the length much. But for other muscles, the, the deformities make a big difference, which actually makes it much harder to do those uh, analyses because you have to get the deformities right. So is this a, a good place to start because the bone deformities don't make a whole lot of difference? You it's a good place to start for exactly that reason. It's easier from a modeling point of view and it's one of the ones that's most commonly lengthened. Yeah. Yes, please. I'm just curious as to how the surgery affects the child as they, as they grow up against the call uh, Does it hinder their growth? No, it's a, it's a soft tissue surgery so there's no intervention at the growth plate in the bone. Um, so uh, there's no evidence that, that having the surgery would inhibit growth, and I, I can't think of a mechanism by which it would. You can certainly imagine that walking in an abnormal gait will affect your bone uh, shape and lead to bone deformities that get, could affect stature, but um, there's bigger problems with the bone deformities than just overall limb length. Okay, so there was a good case. Here's a guy from the other hospital. He had short hamstrings. He didn't have a hamstring lengthening. And here he is a year later. He had some other procedures to try to uh, restore, restore his crouch gait, which may have been done useful things, but they certainly didn't correct his crouch gait. He was in a little bit deeper <coughs> crouch a year later um, and probably would have been a good candidate for hamstring lengthening. Okay, so I show you these case studies, um, not just to show you case studies, but these, there were statistically significant trends for all of these. When the hamstrings were short and they didn't get lengthened, they didn't get longer or faster, they tended not to get better. So I'm showing you as case studies because it's, it's prettier than bar charts, but those were statistically significant trends. Same thing when they uh, didn't have short or slow hamstrings and they did have a hamstring lengthening, their hamstrings didn't get longer and faster and they tended to have a more anterior pelvic tilt. So their hamstrings were weakened and they had more hip flexion and that's a, that's a negative side effect. If you just look at the whole pool, you don't see that negative side effect as being important. But if you look at this subset that got lengthened that didn't need it, you do see that uh, come out. Okay, so that's a really simple model um, that doesn't have any dynamics 
but was uh, a useful, uh, simple model that gets translated into the clinic. This next uh, example, we ask a more fundamental question, which is which muscles support your body weight and propel you forward during walking and during running and during crouch gait? And uh, I did this together with a, a talented graduate student, May Liu, uh, Mike Swartz from the Gillette um, Children's Hospital as well. And to do this, you need a, a dynamic simulation in which you have some way to estimate neural control. You give that neural control to a set of muscles that those muscles have a contractile element and nonlinear tendons, and they uh, act on the musculoskeletal system, and we generate equations of motion for the many degree of freedom dynamic system, and we have a controller that lets you produce a coordinated motion. And we now have methods to uh, fairly rapidly generate abnormal control and abnormal gait dynamics for individuals who walk through our gait analysis laboratory. But before we get to abnormal, um, we just want to understand very well normal gait. This is a simulation of 10 gait cycles that a, a computer science PhD student generated, Chan John, and he developed this uh, computed muscle control algorithm that can determine the pattern of excitation and that tracks the dynamics that we measure. So this is really a tracking algorithm. So it really reproduces the 3D kinematics and dynamics of normal walking at different speeds quite well. The excitation patterns that I'm showing in red here match what we can measure with electromyographic. The ground reaction forces match really well. So we match everything we can measure and then we can compute muscle forces, joint reaction forces, um, quite well. And I'm not going to show you this, but uh, these poor students spend their life doing this, which is, this is experimental data and the simulation data because we spend months and months and months comparing the simulation data to experimental data because until you have a simulation in which you have some confidence, there's no reason to analyze it. And I'm not going to show it in the talk because <laughs> it would just be many analyses like this, but the, the point is, so for example, here's the ankle angle. We can track experimental ankle angles to a very high degree of accuracy. The moments generated by muscles, so if I add all the ankle muscles up and I compare those to experimental moments from inverse dynamics, it's a very good match. The patterns of excitations of muscles match what we can measure. Ground reaction forces match well. So would you say match well? Uh-huh. Like a percent RMS error or something just yeah. to get at the ballpark? Yeah, so the, the kinematics are like one degree RMS error. The, that's the best. Uh, the worst is the, the muscle activation patterns. So muscle activation patterns, the, the experimental signal is noisy. It's variable between subjects. And uh, so if I showed you those, which you notice I'm not showing you those, you wouldn't say they match very well. We get the main things that that you know, when you land, your quadriceps turn on, and your gluteus maximus turns on, your gluteus medius turns on, then those things shut off. So you get, you get the stereotypical patterns. If we have an abnormal uh, walking pattern, we constrain it so that we have their EMG and we make their muscle turn on in the simulation right when their abnormal muscle activity is. So, uh, but then there are lots of muscles for which we don't have measurements and uh, what they're doing could be anything. So I'm glad you brought that up because that's the, that's the real, uh, it's the crux of your question and it's also where we can't test very well. So then getting back to the basic question, how do muscles contribute to support and progression over a range of walking speeds? So what is support? Muscles provide body weight support. They do that by generating ground reaction force and that's what support produces an upward acceleration, and we'll call that support. Can you guys see that okay? You can read support. And then progression is the, the, the fore-aft acceleration. So to do this over a range of walking speeds, Mei Lu generated this small army of simulations. It's hard to generate these simulations and test them all, so that she did eight subjects in four speeds was quite a feat. We also make all of these available, so anybody who doesn't want to do this again can go to uh, simtk.org, download the simulations or documentation, they can get the, the code, they can rerun our simulations, they can reproduce the results, they can, they can do other studies based on those simulations. 
So again, Scott, just real quick, the previous one without dynamics, five minutes, you've got a pipeline. One of these, how long is this? Yes, so uh, let's say we start with the, so when May did it, it took longer. Um, and you can, the up-to-date time. You so know, the up-to-date time, uh, Sam Hamner has this beautiful pipeline for making running simulations, and he can make like two simulations in a day. So uh, he has a whole dashboard where it, he reads in the data, he generates the simulation at each step, he does all these tests, and it generates red and green lights about whether it's passing accuracy tests or not. And that's available on when CTK they, as well. The dashboard isn't, it's just Sam's secret weapon right now. <laughs> When he gets his PhD, I'm sure he'll make it available. Yes, please. So a subject is a, the skeleton resulting from a scan, a CT scan, or what's the what's No, the this subject? subject, so the, yeah, what's specific, subject specific about this is that we capture their data and we represent their gate dynamics. Gotcha, so it's the motion capture that's subject specific. The, the model is a generic model that's scaled to, based on the marker based trajectories. Based on measurements, okay. Yeah, yeah, it's based on about 30 measurements. So the ground reaction forces are what accelerate the mass center. So if I measure the force under the foot and I plot that, there's a vertical component of that, and that's what supports your body weight, and then a horizontal component, you see it's tilted back a little bit, so when you land, it's tilted back, and that slows you down, and then at the end of the push you forward, so that's tilted forward, and that's how you can tell what the mass center is doing. If you want to look at an individual muscle's contribution to the mass center, you can, you have your generic simulation. You perturb the force in that muscle by a very small amount, one Newton, for example, that over a small interval of time, that changes your ground reaction force, that changes your, your um, acceleration of your mass center, and then you can determine what the contribution of that small change in muscle force was to that uh, mass center acceleration. Then you can multiply that DF by the force at that instant and get, for example, for the quadriceps, what contribution the quadriceps are making to the overall ground reaction force, hence the overall mass center acceleration at each time. So this is, these are time marching along here. So the muscle's on then, when it turns on, it supports your body weight, so it pushes you up and it breaks you, it slows you down. So if you want to look at that here, so you can go to a particular time point, you can stop the simulation. One way to do that is to turn off all the other muscles and excite just that one muscle. Now I'm applying a high force here and integrating over a long time so you can see the effect. But you see, not surprisingly, the quadriceps extend the knee. You also see that they extend the ankle and they extend the hip. So even though they don't cross those joints, they produce effects. They also, you can see it affects the motion of the pelvis. So this is why if you see EMG and you see pelvis motion, no one says, oh, the EMG of the quads is causing the pelvis motion because uh, no one really has been able to discern with that level of detail what's going on. Okay, so... The vasti, the quadriceps here, support the body weight in early stance. So here's early stance, here's late stance. And it also slows you. Well, what about at uh, fast speeds and at slow speeds? At fast speeds, the AMG turns up a little bit, force turns up, and it does more of the same. It produces a little more support, a little more braking. When going from free walking to slow walking, the quads basically turn off. They do almost nothing. Whereas in free walking, we have a, a nice bent knee. In slow and very slow walking, we look a lot like these passive dynamic robots that don't have muscles you can't, and, and that walk slowly. They kind of clunk along like this. When the quadriceps don't do much. You see they're, they're producing very little mass center acceleration. More slowly. So when we walk with free speed, this is our self-selected speed, we kind of bounce along a little bit. We're an inverted pendulum, but we're a bouncy inverted pendulum. Whereas when we walk slowly, we're really uh, well represented by an inverted pendulum. Oh, what about the hamstrings? This is, uh, this is tricky. So what if the hamstrings are on in mid stance? We excite the muscle, and what does it do? It extends the hip, 
But it also extends the knee. Watch, I'll replay that again. So the hamstrings cross behind the knee. Oh, I didn't want to see that again. Did you guys see it extend the knee? Going back. OK, so it extends the hip. And it's exaggerated here. I put a high force in. I integrated for 100 milliseconds or something. It extends the, it extends the knee. So how can a muscle that crosses behind the knee extend the knee? Certainly, it crosses behind the knee, and it generates a knee flexion moment. But it also crosses behind the hip, and it generates a hip extension moment. That hip extension moment extends the hip. That hip extension moment also produces an extension acceleration of the knee. The flexion moment that it produces produces a flexion acceleration of the knee, but smaller than the hip knee flexion acceleration produced by the hip moment. So the net effect during mid stance is not much of the knee, actually. So that the activity in this muscle in stance is going to produce a big crouch. It doesn't really make sense from the physics. We're still trying to figure out why some people, after they have a hamstring length, they get better. But from a dynamics point of view, these muscles are not powerful knee flexors during normal walking anyway. They do a little bit more when you're crouched. It's one of the things we're trying to sort out now, so I don't have the answer to that. So gastrocnemius, a big uh, muscle in your calf. In free speed walking, it comes on. It provides a lot of body weight support, and it pushes you forward. And it kind of just modulates with speed. You get a little bit more at fast, but you still need it when you walk slow. There, you can do the statistics on this. There's, there's a speed effect. Soleus, the other big calf muscle, same deal comes on late, provides body weight support. So if you look at this overall curve, muscles provide 90% of that. Skeletal support provides a little bit, but basically muscles do everything to support your body weight and propel you forward, and it's a relatively small number of muscles. Your big hip extensor, knee extensors at first, and then later on, these, uh, your ankle muscles. So if you look at this again, Heel strike, you see the quads come on. So right after heel strike, quads come on. I should stop it. OK, I'm going to sagittal plane again. OK. Hamstrings are on here a little bit. Quads come on. They're producing that braking force. And it's supporting your body weight. Mid stance, your hip abductors. They are supporting a vast majority of your body weight. You also get more skeletal support in mid stance. And at the end here, these muscles are cranking. They have very large forces, and they're becoming highly activated. They're supporting your body weight and propelling you forward. Too bad we had to have such a fancy simulation to figure out such a simple <laughs> idea. But that's the summary. So what about running? Sam Hamner is a mechanical engineering graduate student who's making 3D dynamic simulations of running. Turns out it's the same muscles. About the same timing, but higher forces, and they're doing uh, the same thing. If you guys start looking at the heel toe, the big heel toe question now, right? Should, do you go to a lighter shoe and start running on the ball of your foot, or do you wear the big old heel cup like everybody has for years and do heel? You guys start doing, has he started doing some of those simulations yet? We have, uh, we've uh, now measured uh, lots of runners running at different speeds, and some of them are forefoot strikers, some of them are hindfoot strikers, and uh, all of them are excellent runners. And um, you guys know the argument that the, the bad news about good running shoes is people who don't know how to run can bang their heels into the ground and generate large ground reaction forces. And uh, habitual runners who run barefoot all the time have this beautiful light gait that uh, produces a more gradual ground reaction force. And now bad runners are wearing uh, minimal shoes and uh, still running badly, uh, but running gingerly and uh, for fear of hurting their feet. And uh, so now they're running more gingerly and probably having lower ground reaction forces. I'm a little cynical about this whole thing. I think the pendulum's going to swing back a little bit. Um, but so we're starting to look at it, but I'm just spouting now. I don't really know any answers yet. <laughs> we'll, we'll tell you when Sam's done with his PhD. So in running, muscles provide the whole ground reaction force. So this is 2.0 body weights. So this is relatively slow running. The 
uh, gray is the experimental ground reaction force. The blue is the reaction force produced by muscles. So muscles are, are doing it all. This is an artifact. We don't simulate very well that initial contact phase, as you might imagine why, if you do simulations. Um, so muscles, uh, the quads produce body weight support and break you. The soleus supports body weight and pushes you forward in late stance. So it's kind of the same story as in running. Gastrocnemius, that big muscle in the back of your calf. So these are very nicely synchronized. Yeah. Quads come on and shut off. Plantar flexors and calf muscles come on and then shut off. Very nicely timed. You know, you're only on, uh, this is percent of stance, but you're only on the ground for a very short period of time. So these muscles have 50 or 100 milliseconds, for example, to come on and do their job. Kat Steele's been looking at dynamic simulations of subjects with crouch gait. <clears throat> and what we're finding in these subjects is that it's not this very finely uh, controlled muscles turning on for a short period of time, producing their desired acceleration and then shutting down. Essentially, when you land and crouch, all of the extensors turn on and stay on. It's a very simple control strategy. You just turn all your extensors on. It's exactly what uh, infants do when they first start to walk is they they turn all of their extensors on and then they flex too much. And they turn all of their extensors on and then flex too much. It's a simple control strategy. It could be that some subjects crouch because it is so much simpler. Walking with straight knees is very difficult to control. This is, uh, if you look at the, the matrices that describe this, the, the, they're very ill-conditioned when your knee gets near straight. Whereas if you flex a little bit and walk like this, which is why the, the Honda robot, for example, walks with uh, crouch knees. It's just much easier to control. So um, subject with crouch gait are using this on-off control where all the muscles turn on during the whole stance phase. And then they have a hard time shutting off. So they stay on during swing and disrupt swing. OK, so those were the two protracted examples. Good time for questions. So what do you expect the implications for therapies for crouch gait to be? Yeah, so uh, there, it's a little tricky to give a short statement about that. But if, for example, the hamstrings are short and tight, they're probably a good hamstring candidate. If their hamstrings, for example, have plenty of length and plenty of velocity, but they have problems with motor control, and the reason they're crouching is to have this simpler control strategy, then uh, surgical reconstruction is not going to help with that. They need some kind of neuromuscular retraining or balance control or something else. Um, if bone deformities are causing the problem, then when correcting those really can help a lot. So the, the, uh, it's hard for me to give, it's a complicated flow chart, but what we're trying to come up with is a, a rational measure, set of measurements that you can make to have branch points in a treatment flow chart so that you identify the cause and treat the cause instead of wondering what the cause is and, and, and treating everything or part, part of the cause. Okay, five of the 37 challenges for the future. <laughs> Hopefully I will name some of your challenges. So we're pretty good at modeling normal muscle, the field that is. There's been thousands of experiments on muscle. That's normal muscle in a dish. We know very little about muscle with pathology or after surgery or after treatments. We've been doing imaging studies with Sydney phase contrast MRI to characterize muscle tendon contraction mechanics in individuals with cerebral palsy. Uh, Mike Llewellyn in my lab uh, invented this really nifty uh, microendoscope. This is a 300 uh, micron endoscope that you can put into muscle and see sarcomeres in muscle. So these are the basic contractile units of muscle. It's thought in cases of muscle contracture where the muscle's tight that these are very stretched out and producing passive force, but no one's ever seen a sarcomere um, in vivo in a, with someone with contracture. So we're just, uh, now we have a clinical instrument. Now that Mike can discover the basic technology, we produce the clinical instrument. So we're stabbing everyone we can get into the lab uh, because we need to have models of abnormal muscle. We need to represent bone geometry, muscle postoperatively, and muscles after surgery. So this, for example, is one of the quadriceps, the rectus femoris. It's usually attached to the patella. Here it is detached and tied to another muscle. We've been doing imaging studies showing that 
Bad news is this muscle comes down and scars to the underlying muscle, so it's supposed to convert from an extensor of the knee down, now it's a flexor to a flexor of the knee, but it's not working because it's scarring. The bad news for the modeling is we assume all these actuators are independent, but they aren't, they're connected. And so how to model this uh, connective tissue is not gonna work with our simple models. You need something like FE Bio style muscle models to represent uh, scar tissue between muscles postoperatively. Our simulations are really uh, slow, finding element simulations of muscle. Ron Fedku, who may uh, be known to some of you, has been working on uh, with Joey Turan, Sylvia Blemker. Oh, this is a cool movie. Oh, there we go. He can do, uh, we can do like three muscles in a day and a half. So uh, Ron, because he doesn't, it's a computer graphics thing, he doesn't really care about accuracy, well, it looks pretty darn good, he can do uh, you know, 20 muscles in the same time with all the, the contact modeling and everything. And so some of the algorithms, this is a real need, is fast fighting elements for doing 3D muscle models because we aren't even close. So we, we really need much faster models. Is that Ron in his bodybuilding days? He used to no, be it isn't. This is actually, you know, it's pretty interesting. Everybody look, if you take off everybody's fat, they look like this. So there's no fat on this. If you just take an MRI and take off all the fat, everyone looks like really <laughs> tight. <laughs> This is, the, this is the visible human guy who really was huge. So uh, another challenge is just sharing simulations. Most of the field, you read about a simulation in a paper and no one can reproduce it. And uh, it's hard to argue you're doing science if no one can reproduce your results. So we've been trying to encourage people to share simulations, not just at simtk.org, but uh, when someone publishes a paper that they online have the software and simulation and, and uh, results so that others can build on that. And we've been getting some uh, traction with that. We have these, we get to keep track of all the people that download the simulations and where they are and make a little mailing list. And so uh, that's been quite encouraging and it's great for graduate students. I didn't realize this benefit, but uh, you know, I have a graduate student like Sam does the running simulation, he puts it on there, people start downloading it. He wants to take a vacation in New Zealand. <laughs> he can go in this little bubble, and he can figure out who that is, write them, and get invited to New Zealand. <laughs> so uh, there are many benefits to this. I think the most important is having a group of people bang on your simulations to see if they're correct. Another big challenge is efficient computational algorithms to control simulations. So we develop these tracking simulations, where if I have somebody's data, I can make it reasonable replica of their gait dynamics uh, using this computed muscle control algorithm that we published. What uh, you'd prefer is predictive simulations. And we have a new algorithm for developing predictive simulations that I wanted to show you. And I embedded it in PowerPoint, but then it got real uh, jerky. So let me show you. What do I do? Full screen? So Jack Wong developed this uh, controller. The theory was that if we actuated things biologically, they would look natural. So we didn't do any uh, mocap to control these simulations. But what we did was we took a, a controller and we actuated it with muscles. The previous state of the art for these kind of, uh, this type of controllers could generate gates, but they didn't look very natural. But if the theory was, if we ensured biological constraints on activation with just a few muscles, I can't point where I get the controller up, that we'd get more natural looking gate. And so the controller uh, doesn't work at first. We give it some initial <laughs> conditions. We command a speed, and we require the torso not to fall, fall over. But the controller is basically uh, learning the parameters that give us uh, optimal gait for this particular speed. And what's being optimized here is we're minimizing the metabolic cost. So uh, I like this one. After 50 iterations, you have kind of the drunk run. <laughs> uh, and then it generates a pretty nice smooth. And I'm not going to show you the comparisons. We didn't use any experimental data. 
to generate these simulations, but when we compare the moments, for example, generated by the muscles to running moments, they're really right on. They're very smooth and very realistic. So, you know, two years ago, the SIGGRAPH paper for walking looked like that, and now uh, we have these more natural appearing gates. So fast walk is certainly entertaining, but not very <laughs> biological. The happy walk, especially the very fast walk, is super happy. <laughs> that's, how, that's how I am in the morning. <laughs> Versus the determined walk on the right. So we tried different objective functions. So a lot of people use the sum of squared torch. You get this kind of crouch gate. So minimizing the sum of squared joint torch, which is commonly done in computer graphics, results in overactivation of many muscles. The tibialis anterior is one that's highlighted here. We tried minimizing the sum of squared activations. And you, again, get this kind of crouch gait. It's energetically costly and doesn't look uh, natural. Even though we're minimizing the activations of muscles, we're not minimizing the metabolic cost. Whereas on the right, we minimize metabolic cost. The other thing you can do, once you have a predictive controller, you can weaken muscles. So what if I weaken gastrocnemius and soleus, these big muscles we talked about? You get this crouch gait. This is exactly what happens if somebody has a, a, a tendo Achilles lengthening and has weak gastroc and soleus, they get this kind of crouch gait pattern. We can weaken the hamstrings. It's exactly what happens if somebody has a hamstring surgery and didn't uh, need it. They get this knee hyperextension gait. Their hamstrings aren't active and they land with a really extended knee. I'm not sure this is what's causing it, but it was remarkable. Weak quadriceps. You get this quadriceps avoidance gait. So it's pretty cool. We have this controller that we can then weaken muscles we can, and, and see what happens. We can also optimize for robustness. So here's a controller that's uh, not robust. So if you push it over, it falls down. But then we can optimize the controller train to withstand these uh, pushes. So Jack optimized this for a 100 Newton push for 0.4 seconds. And it, it does pretty well. It can withstand these things. You use the same controller for walking and running and uh, you have to re-optimize for the, the parameters for running. This is a different push force, but you see it's pretty robust. This is, 50 Newtons is, you know, 12 pounds. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a shove. And then the same controller works for a range of walking speeds. So one meter per second is a pretty slow walk. Um, this is about self-selected speed. 1.5 is a pretty fast walk. This is about as fast as you can walk without running. So the same controller works for all these speeds. This is about as slow as you can run without walking. And so it's pretty nifty. The same control parameters can generate this whole range of gates. And like I said, the, the, the patterns of joint angles, we, we collect data, obviously, so we can compare. We don't use the data to generate this, but the, the Joint angles and joint moments and patterns of excitation are quite uh, natural. Question? Yes, please. I seem to have missed something here in, in these simulations. Uh, where is the sensory information coming from, and how is that dealt with? Yes, yeah, so in this, uh, in this predictive control, uh, you have perfect sensory information. You know all the joint angles and angular velocities, and that's used in the control. Uh, so, and in the biologic system, you have pretty good sensory information because you know all the muscle lengths and velocities and forces. So the final challenge is to predict clinical outcomes accurately. So we work with many uh, clinical centers, and uh, we have been able to identify a relatively small number of biomechanical parameters that we can demonstrate when surgery or therapy is done in accordance with these biomechanical principles, the outcomes are better. Uh, Jen Hicks did a beautiful uh, statistical analysis across uh, several clinical centers and demonstrated with, a, with the insights that we get from simulations, indeed you get uh, better treatment outcomes. Uh, we're just scratching the surface there and this is of course the most uh, important challenge. I just want to thank a few people, especially Sam Hamner, superstar running simulation. Jack Wong made that nice uh, controller. AJ Seth and uh, Ayman Habib do the simulation software. SciCat Paul is a fantastic uh, 3D front element simulation person and Jen Hicks did the statistical models.
Pat Steele did the crouch gate simulation. And Chand is the computer scientist who did that long walking simulation. And of course, the NIH for making the world go round. Thank all of you, too. Thanks, Scott. OK, so that was an hour with questions at 3. Uh, I guess if people need to leave, that's fine. We can ask questions yeah. if you want. OK. So I have a question. Thank you very much. It was really great. I have a question about statistics. So do you like personalized models? And then you still have to decide if this is normal or not, or what is normal, what is the reality of normal. And you have infants, you have adults, you have gender related. So how do you plan to do statistics on these complex yeah, that's, it's a little tricky to answer that because usually we end up doing statistics with respect to a particular question. Um, and you're also alluding to the problem of scaling and growth, um, both of which are major problems, scaling musculoskeletal structures and recognition.